Come on now. What? What? All right. Hey, $23,000 to Annie Armstrong Mission Offering. Get it up before the Lord. Come on. Yes. And you thought I was going to get my hair cut. No, -uh, no. All right. Hey, by the way, you know what I look like? I look, if, if, if Buddha had gotten saved and God called him to be a preacher, you're looking at him right now. All right. So anyway, so enough of that. All right. But praise the Lord uh, for 23,000 to, uh, to missions. Man, you, you're, uh, your generosity is amazing. How many of you glad you're at the lake today? Come on, put your hands together. Come on, let's give it up. Am I here all right? Thank you, Chris. Okay, all right, okay. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Years ago, uh, our mission, we had a mission team that was uh, in Guatemala. And we were going from Guatemala to uh, Punta Gorda in Belize, and we had to go across the Gulf of Honduras to do it. So we're at this dock in Guatemala, and they're loading the boat. It's a 10-passenger boat, and they're putting over 20 people in this boat. And the more that people got on it, the lower it got to the water. That wasn't bad enough, but a tremendous storm was coming on the horizon. It had gotten dark. Uh, the waves were beating up against the boat. And the more people that they loaded on the boat, the closer the waves got to being over the boat. Now, I'm no sailor. I don't know anything about sailor, but I know this. If a boat is on top of the water, that's pretty good. But when water's in the boat, how many of you say, no, man, that's bad, right? And so it got lower and lower. And I looked at our mission team and I said, surely we're not going. Because, I mean, the storm had come down. And no sooner had I said that, he cranked up the engines and off we went. And they put these... Uh, you know, tarps over us and, and all of that. And the rain, rain and the wind, it was horrible. Now, I was okay with it at first until I wasn't. Because at first, I could see the shoreline as we were going along. And I thought, well, if this boat turns over, I know where I'm going. I mean, you know. And so, but for some unknown, unknown reason, nobody knows why, uh, that captain decided in the middle of a torrid storm to go out to the middle of the Gulf so that we couldn't see the shoreline or anything. I mean, it got bad. It was so bad. We were rocking so bad, and the boat was jumping so bad. A concrete bench came apart and almost broke one of our deacon's legs. I mean, the boat was coming apart, and we were still, the rain and the wind and the waves were still coming on. I had a Guatemalan family sitting beside me with a little girl, and she was scared, all of us, but she was scared to death. And I, I wanted to tell her, hey, sweetheart, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Well, I didn't tell her that for two reasons. Number one, I couldn't speak the language. And number two, I was scared to death. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just, man, I just, this is it. This is it. Uh, you know, right home, tell everybody. But well, at least I got killed on a mission trip. That's, that's pretty good. That's, that's better than, you know, going bird hunting. But anyway, and, and so... It was bad, and, and so I just prayed to the Lord, and I said, God, if you will get me safely to shore, then I promise you that for the rest of my life, I will eat Krispy Kreme donuts. You know what I'm saying? And I have kept that promise to this day. How many of you know that? All right. Anyway, so the bottom, thank you. Uh, the, uh, but it was scary, and as we were going through that, uh, this scripture that we're going to read today came to my mind of how, you know, Jesus calmed the storm and the winds and the waves obeyed him. But then he told the disciples, he said, what are you afraid of? Why do you not have any faith? And uh, we're going to look at that. And I got to think about that. So today's message, it's twofold. It's two parts. We're going to cover two stories today in our study and the gospel of Mark. And we're going to talk about how Jesus calms the storms around you and how Jesus can calm the storms in you as well. So everybody grab your Bible. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4. We're going to be beginning at verse 35. Gospel of Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Let's all stand for the reading and honor of God's Word. Mark 4, 35. If you found it, say found it. All right, we're ready. Mark 4, 35. On that day, when evening had come, 
he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. So they woke him up and they said, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, silence, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. And they asked one another, who is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. This is what we're talking about in the gospel of Mark. We're asking the question, this remarkable Jesus, who is this remarkable? Who is this guy? Let's go to chapter five, look at verse one. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasians, and as soon as he got up out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. And he lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain. Uh, Jesus tells the the demons that are in him to go somewhere else. He casts them out, and they decide to go into a, a herd of swine, and they jump off of a cliff. Jump down to verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and they saw the man who'd been demon-possessed sitting there, dressed in his right mind. He was at peace. And yet they were afraid. Who is Jesus? What kind of authority, what kind of power does he have to calm the storms around us and to calm the storms in us. That's what we're going to talk about today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the music, the fellowship, for the generosity of our people and missions given and serving. We just thank you for it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. The Sea of Galilee is not a sea. Uh, It is a freshwater lake. And it's a large lake, a tremendous large lake, but it sits... 600 feet below sea level. It's the lowest lying lake uh, in the world. Uh, It is uh, uh, seven uh, seven miles wide and 14 miles long. Now, it's in a basin, and because it's in a basin surrounded by mountains, then you have the heat of the basin, then you have the cool air of the mountains that come down into that basin, so the weather on the Sea of Galilee can be extremely fickle. It can, it can change from moment uh, to moment. Uh, so now Jesus has been teaching from a boat. We talked about that last week, Pastor Andrew. And when evening came, now, now understand that, when evening came, Jesus tells the disciples, get on the boat, let's go to the other side. Well, it's evening. And to go from Capernaum all the way over to the land of the Gerasenes is a three-hour trip, either rowing or sailing. So Jesus is telling his disciples, get in the boat. We're going on a three-hour tour. (laughs) A three-hour tour. Most of y'all don't get that, but anyway, (laughs) old people do. Uh, But it's evening. And, the, and the, I'm sure they didn't ask, but I'm sure they're saying, can it wait till morning? I mean, this is three hours. It's going to be in the middle of the night anyway, which is scary enough. But then they're going to encounter this tremendous storm. And uh, so Jesus has been teaching all this time. And he's not through. And he's never through teaching us. You, you never learn it all from Jesus. And he's not through. And he's going to show these disciples his complete authority, his control over storms in our life. Storms that happen to us and storms that happen in us, he is in full control. So if you're a note taker, you might want to take notes today because you're going to need this. We all need this lesson today in in our study in the Gospel of Mark. So here's, here's several lessons we learned. Number one, storms come even when you're close to Jesus. Storms come No matter how close you are to Jesus, no matter what proximity Jesus is to you, storms are going to come. 
Doesn't, it doesn't matter how much you pray. Doesn't matter how much you go to church. Doesn't how much you give. Doesn't matter how much you read your Bible. Storms come. Nobody is exempt from storms that come upon us. And all God's people said, amen? Now, there are times that things are going to happen. That We live in a sin-cursed world. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. But he followed that up, and he said, be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. But it doesn't take away that storms come. Life is like that. There's an amazing verse of Scripture in the book of Amos. Uh, you don't have to turn to it. It's really kind of referring to the end times. But I love this. In Amos chapter 5, verse 19, listen to this. This is what Amos said. He said, it will be like a man who flees from a lion only to run into a bear. And then he goes home. And he's so wore out from running from a lion and a bear, he puts his hand on the wall to get his breath, and a snake bites him. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like that's your life? That's, yeah, that's a description of what I'm going through. I run into a lion. I get away from him. I run into a bear. Then I go home, try to catch my breath, and a snake gets me. That's life. And we get that way sometimes. We feel that way sometimes. But remember... Storms come, but come on, come on. Anybody glad that when storm comes, Jesus doesn't jump out of the boat? When storm comes, he's in the boat with you. And all God's people say, it's an amazing thing. Here's lesson number two. Jesus permits storms to test us. Let me say that again. Jesus permits storms. You get a storm in your life. It's not haphazard. He, He permits storms to test us. There's a I don't know if you've seen this commercial or not. You probably have. There's a commercial about a guy that goes around in an RV, and, uh, and he asks people on the street, how's your heart? You ever seen that? It, it's, it's, a, it's a commercial for a cardio mobile uh, EKG device that fits in your wallet. You can take it out, and you put your fingers on it and, it, and it reads your EKG. So he goes around saying, how's your heart? Now, he's talking about their physical heart. How's your heart? And people say, well, I think it's okay. I don't know sure. Well, Jesus this morning would ask every single one of us this morning, how's your heart? How's your heart? How's your spiritual heart? How's your walk with Jesus? And probably most of us here to say, well, it's okay. I mean, I think we all would agree that, you know, it's not what it should be, uh, but, I, you know, but it's, I, I don't, I want to get better. I want to do better. I want to get closer. I want to know more. I think most of us could say that. But Jesus would ask us, how's your spiritual heart? And it would be easy for us to say, well, it's, it's okay. Then Jesus would say, well, how do you know? How do you know where your heart is? How do you know how your heart's doing? How do you know? Well, the bottom line is, folks, you can't know unless at times, not every time, but at times your heart is tested. Jesus has to test our heart to find out. We go along in life. We think we're doing good. We think we're doing fine. Jesus said, okay, let's just see. Let me see how you react when a storm hits you. Let me see how you react when when I rock your world, when I rock your boat. Let's see how you react. Are you going to react in fear? Are you going to react in faith? How are you going to react? It has to be tested. And uh, we never get through that. So how's your heart? It has to be tested. You really can't know. Now, Jesus in chapter 4 is teaching the disciples about the different kind of souls. Pastor Andrew talked about that last week. And it's really about the heart, the souls of the heart of, of people and how they receive the word of God or reject the word of God and all that. Well, Jesus is the ultimate teacher. And just like the ultimate teacher, he's taught the class. Now he gives the test. He gives the test. That's, that's, that's what it does. And I'm going to tell you, they failed the test. But they're not the only ones. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, when it comes to the test of am I going to react in fear or I'm going to react in faith when the storm and the winds and the waves come in on my life or my family's life, how do I react? And I'll be honest with you. There are times, not every time, but too many times I fail the test. And I would imagine I got some kin folk here today in this auditorium. You probably do the same thing. But how many of you are glad that just because we failed the test, he don't kick us out of class? And all God's people said, amen? amen? He doesn't kick you out of class. And by the way, this test 
The disciples failed that test, and they failed other tests, all the way up to the resurrection. They kept failing these tests, but Jesus never kicked them out of the class. He's not through with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we're always growing. Jesus is always working, always speaking to us, always teaching us, and God's glory gets it when we pass some of these tests because other tests are going to come, but he never gives up on us. How many of you believe that today? Yeah. Never, never gives up on us. And he never kicks us out of class. He still loves us. He still loves us. Here's the third lesson. Jesus will either calm the storm or he'll calm you. He'll either calm the storm or he'll calm me. He'll call you, he'll calm you, one or, one or the other. Now, keep in mind that many of the guys that were on this boat that day were seasoned fishermen. They, Peter, James, and John were raised on the Sea of Galilee. They know all about the Sea of Galilee. And this storm was so bad that they were scared. This storm was so bad that they thought they were going to die. And I love the fact that in the middle of this storm, they go find Jesus at the back of the boat. He's asleep on a pillow or a cushion or something. He's asleep. They go look. Jesus is not just there in the storm. He's asleep in the storm. The waves are breaking in the boat and the sails are coming apart. The boat is coming apart and they go find Jesus and he is asleep. He turned those waves into his own waterbed. Isn't that just like Jesus? I mean, he was just asleep. They wake him up. Don't you get up. Don't you worry that we're about to die. And Jesus, I don't, I don't know. Maybe when we get to heaven, I'll ask him. But I wonder if Jesus ever rolled his eyes at those guys. <laughs> right? I'm wondering if he ever went, <sighs> you know, like your teenagers do. <sighs> I'm wondering if he, he just, guys, <clears throat> peace, be still. Now, I don't know how he did. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know the volume. It was, it was really windy. It was really noisy because, as a matter of fact, the be still, the, the, the Greek word there means to mute, be muted. And I don't know, maybe he said, Peace, be still, like Charlton Heston on a movie. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe he didn't have to do that. Maybe he just said, Peace, be still, waves, chill out, wind, quit it. But the bottom line, and I'm so glad that Jesus has got us. I'm so glad that no matter what we go through, if you know Jesus as your Savior, I'm so glad that no matter how bad the wind and the waves and the storm comes upon you, if you have Jesus in the boat of your life, that he's got you. We used to sing an old song, he's got the whole world in his hand. Does anybody believe that this morning? Say amen. He's got the whole world in his hands for you and for me. He's got this. Do you think for one moment Jesus is up in his heaven wringing his hands? You think for one moment the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are looking down on America and they're saying, how in the world did they get in such a mess? How in the world are they doing what they're doing? How in the world did right become wrong and wrong become right? Father, do you know how? Holy Spirit, do you know how? No, we don't know how. I don't know. I don't know how that happened. We missed that somewhere. Now, no, 10,000 times no. He never wrings his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter what's going on in this life, no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on in your world, Jesus has us. He is in full, total, sovereign control. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that truth, right? He's in control. He never misses a beat. He never looks at you and says, oh, I'm sorry, man. I, di I, didn't see, I didn't see that sickness coming. My bad. No. Listen, and you've heard me say this before. I hear people say, well, you know, God, God allows it. God allows it. Personally, I go beyond that. I think when things happen, God is orchestrating. He's orchestrating it because he... He never misses a beat. He's got us. He's got you in his hand. He's not going to let you, he's not going to let you fall or falter. He's got you. So, so I love the fact that he was a, not just with them in the boat. He was asleep. Like this storm, it may be everything to you guys, but 
it's kind of helping me get a little bit of sleep. So understand that. The Titanic sank on April the 15th, 1912. 1,500 people lost their lives on the Titanic. It was billed as an unsinkable ship. And when you think about it, that's the only thing it did was sink. That's all it's known for. That's, that's why it's famous. It sank. Well, there's only, I, I, we just read this morning about the only unsinkable ship that you've ever read about in all of human history, and it was that little boat that they were on because Jesus was on that boat. Amen? Amen. Unsinkable. He's not going to let you sink. He's got you. He didn't bring you this far. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He's got us. It may not seem like it sometimes. We may, we may say, Lord, don't you care that we're dying? Don't you care that I have this sickness, this illness? Don't you care that my husband and wife won't see me? Don't you, don't you care that my kids are on drugs? Don't, don't you care that I can't get a job? Jesus said, look, just trust me. I've got you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm so glad there's never been a split in the Trinity, aren't you? There's still Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, that's storms that happen to us. And to be honest with you, we can't do anything about those. They're greater than us. They're bigger than us. They come upon us. We didn't ask for it, you know, but it happens. It, we live in a sin-sick world where storms happen, storms come. And uh, it comes on the guilty, it comes on the innocent, it comes on the close to Jesus, it doesn't matter. But let's talk a moment about storms that happen in us. Because now we're going to read about a man who had a tremendous storm within him. He was in turmoil. Uh, look at Mark chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Now, obviously, these two sermons could be totally, completely different sermons. I get that. But look at Mark chapter 5, look at verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the uh, Gerasenes. As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain. This is a different kind of storm. They just experienced, the disciples just experienced storms that happened around them. Now they're watching this man who has a storm within him. This possessed man, this demon-possessed man. Now, I want everybody to look up here for a moment. I did a deep dive into this, and I know I've got two really, really good Bible teachers that I preach in front of almost every Sunday. It makes me a little nervous. And if I mess up, they let me know it. But anyway, so um, I did a deep dive in this. The word demon possession in the original Scripture is not there. Uh, it's never there as two words. Uh, that's, a trans, that's a translation from biblical scholars, but the bottom line is demon possession as two words is not in the original language. Uh, the Greek word is daimonizma, and it means demonized. It means to be demonized. And when you see demon possession in the Bible, it's always one Greek word, daimonizma. And, uh, and in other words, the Bible's teaching us that yes, this man was possessed, don't get me wrong. Uh, Satan had totally taken over his life, but the bottom line is, it was his choice. It was his choice to be demonized. Somewhere down the line, he gave into the lies of Satan. Somewhere down the line, he got dabbled into the occult. Could you imagine all the pagan worship that went on in those days? And he's already in a land that's gotten so far from God, uh, you can imagine. Uh, so, he, so this man had given in to the lies of, de of the devil. This man had given in to the occult. This man had given in uh, to pagan worship, but he didn't have to. Here's two, here's two great dangers when you talk about the devil and demon possession. Number one is not to believe in it. That's a big, big mistake. The devil is real. He's real. How many believe there's a real devil? Amen? I'm not, I'm not talking about some big ima imagination. Yeah, and around here, around this church, you're not going to get any vague references to Jesus, and you're not going to get any vague references to Satan. He's real. But here's the other problem we have that. We assign way too much power to him. Yep. Way too much power. He, he doesn't have all power. 
He tries to make you think he does. I hear people say, well, you know, preacher, I couldn't help it. The devil made me do it. Devil don't make you do nothing. Now, here's, here's what I know you, the question you got. I can see it on your face. Well, pastor, do you think a child of God, a true believer in Jesus could be demon possessed? I make, I'll make it simple for you. No. Everybody say no. No, it's absolutely impossible. You say, why is that? Because when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came into me and he sealed me unto the day of redemption. And two cannot walk together unless they agreed. You cannot have the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of the devil living in you at the same time. And all God's people said, but that doesn't excuse us from spiritual warfare. We do battle with Satan every single day of our life. A Christian cannot be possessed by the devil, but you can be oppressed by the devil. Believe in his lies. Listen to so many voices in the wind, dabbling in things you shouldn't be dabbling in, listening to things you shouldn't be listening to, doing things you shouldn't be doing. But he can't, he can't possess a believer. And even an unbeliever has the authority to keep them out, but they dabble in it. They give Satan too much permission in their life. But you're not a pawn. You're not a pawn in the game of life. You have a choice. It's not like we, 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 we tend to think that the devil can come upon somebody and they don't have anything to do with it. No, that, that's just not true. The bottom line, he doesn't, he doesn't have that kind of power. My wife bought, years ago, she bought a new dress. And she hardly ever buys a new dress. And, uh, and it was an expensive dress. And we couldn't afford it. And uh, so she brought it home. And she said, you like my dress? I said, yeah. I said, but we can't afford it. She said, I know, honey, but uh, I, just, I just had to buy it. I said, well, honey, why, did, why didn't you do what the Bible says? Why, when you were tempted to buy that dress that we can't afford, why, did, why didn't you tell Satan, Satan, get thee behind me? She said, honey, I did. And he said, it looks good from back here too. Oh, uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. My, my wife has never in her whole life bought an expensive dress. But anyway, but we kind of, we got to think the devil made me do it. And the devil can't make you do it. He doesn't have that authority to make you do anything as a child of God. As a matter of fact, people who do get possessed and they do, they got demonized because somewhere down the line, they gave in to the wrong voices. They didn't listen to the word of God, whatever it may be. It's called demonized. And uh, but for a child of God, no, we, we have a choice. We're not pawns in this game of life. Uh, so uh, we're, we're never that. Now, by the way, I want to say this. I already asked this question a little bit. I, I, I asked it, I, I would have mind, the Bible didn't say, it's getting evening. Jesus tells those disciples, let's go to the other side. It's evening. We're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna do three hours. It's gonna be in the pitch dark. Can it wait till morning? No, it can't. Now why? Why can't it? For one express purpose. Jesus knew there was a man over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee that was being tormented, that he had a storm in his life. And Jesus made his way to deliver him, to give him peace. Now, the book of Matthew says there's two men. And so I think Mark is talking about the one man that did all the talking. But there were several, there were several men there that day that needed some peace in their life. You experiencing a storm? You got some waves and winds beating against your, your life? You, uh, are, you can, are you worried about some of the things that are taking place in the world today? Well, you know what we need to do? We need to do what these disciples did. We need to do what that demonized man did. We need to make a beeline for Jesus. Amen. We need to get to him. And when we get, we'll find he's there. He's already there. He's waiting on you. He will do everything he can do to give you peace in your heart. 
everything he could do to calm us. The winds, the waves, the demons of hell obeyed Jesus. The question this morning is, will we? Will we? They knew his authority. They knew his power. They knew his sovereignty. Matter of fact, his authority was so great, it scared them to death. So why don't we obey him? I'd like for you to bow your head, please, and every eye closed, and I'd like for you to stand, if you would. Everyone standing. Heads are still bowed. Outs are still closed. Now, let me ask you something. The greatest thing that God wants you to do, first of all, to obey him is to get saved, is to come to Jesus. Know Jesus as your personal Savior. That's the first thing that God wants you to obey him with. And there may be somebody here today, and you've just been, you, you've just been churned about that. You, you've been questioning that. You're not quite sure about that. You hear people talking about it, but you don't, really don't know what that means. And so there's something in your heart that's at unrest. And, you need, and God wants you to settle that today. He wants to give you peace about where you're going to be when you die. It's the greatest question in all the world. Where are you going to spend eternity, either hell or even heaven, depending on what you do with Jesus? There's no doubt about it. So your heart is churned about that. Well, first of all, you're here today and you say, Pastor, I thank God that there was a day and a moment and a time in my life when I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin, and he did. And I didn't have to jump through any hoops. I didn't have to sign any papers. I didn't have to take a class. By simple faith, I asked him, forgive me my sin and be my Savior. And he did. I may not have understood it all then, but I understand now that I'm just as sure for heaven as I'm standing in this worship center today. All over the building, if you know that, all because of Jesus, not because of you, all because of Jesus, you know that. Raise your hand. Raise them up, hold them up, keep them up. I like to raise both hands because I'm doubly sure. If you do that, all over the building, amen, amen. Wish you could see all the hands going up. I love, I love pastoring a church where so many people have that assurance. Thank you, you can put your hands down. Now I want everybody to look over here just for a moment. There is one area of obedience. Now, now that you've done that, there's another area of obedience that's vital. And when we talk about it, you start churning inside. When we talk about it, uh, you write it off and you say, well, I've already done that. Or you say, I don't need to do that. Or you say, well, I did that when I was a little baby. My, my, parents, my parents got me squared away with that. But you know in your heart, because we're getting ready to baptize. We're going to have a couple of people to get baptized today. How many of you excited about that? Come on, put your hands together. Amen. But I want to invite you, those of you that are here today, and you question that. And every time we have a baptism, we say, listen, you need to be scripturally baptized. The Bible method of baptism is always believe and trust Christ first, then be baptized. And if you've ever gotten that out of order, you have not been scripturally baptized. If you got baptized and you weren't a believer, then you're not scripturally baptized. So now you need to, and now that you're a believer, you've trusted Christ because hands went up all over this building. I get that, praise God for that. But have you followed through in obedience. Even the winds and the waves and the devils of hell obeyed Jesus. What about you? What about in this area of your baptism? We're ready for you, by the way. We've got towels. We got shirts. We got change of clothes. You know, we got all that. I don't know if we have hair dryers, but you can wear my bald wig if you want to. It's okay. But the bottom line is Jesus went all the way to Calvary's cross for you. He hung naked, bleeding and dying for you. The least you can do is follow the Lord in believer's baptism. If you've never done that, today's your day. Today is your day. And we invite you to come over here to my left, to your right, where the baptistry is. There's people waiting on you. There's some of you here today. I really believe this with all my heart. You've been struggling with this. Your, uh, your life is 
kind of struggling with this. You need to be at peace. You say, well, I'm not, you know, I think, I think my baptism took, but once again, how's your heart? Well, I'm not sure. Well, get sure. Be obedient to Jesus. Settle that today. Follow the Lord in believer's baptism, if you'll do that. Our praise team is going to sing. And I'm asking, I'd, I'd like for you to bow, bow your head, every head bowed and every eye closed every, right now before the praise team sing. Anybody here today, I'm talking to you. The Holy Spirit is talking to you and saying, yeah, I, I, I need to settle this with baptism today. Well, raise your hand. Anybody in the building? Come on, be honest with God. All right? Be honest with God. Okay. And we're going to sing. Your heart is being convicted right now, so settle it today. Obey him. Why don't you, Jesus would say, why don't you have faith? Just trust me. So while the praise team sings, and we've got several we're going to baptize, you be one of them. God leads you. God, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. Be obedient to him. Do what God would have you to do right now. You need to follow the Lord, believer's baptism. You go ahead and make your way over there. Do what God wants you to do in Jesus' name. Praise team, lead us as we sing.